Hi, my name is Loris Crow, and we are executing at Showtime. Zeke Showtime is the show where members of the Zeke community come on stream to share coded ideas with the broader public. Every episode features two speakers who will present and take questions from you, the viewers. Zeke Showtime is not just what you're seeing on the live stream, but also the discussions that you can have while watching, and that's why I encourage you to join one of the existing Zeke communities that you can find by going to zeklang.org. Um, hello, welcome to episode number uh, 19, I believe. And um, we have two pretty interesting sections uh, sessions today uh we're gonna start with king who is going to talk about um schedulers and after him we're gonna have a group chat with a few interesting people uh jacob uh people that you all should know if you've been watching the show so jacob frank uh, and andrew and we're gonna talk about uh what the hell is going on with apple silicon uh because it's these are interesting times um, before we start with the talks, I'll just bring up a couple of news. So let me, uh, let me press these buttons. Okay. So you can all see everything I want you to see. Uh, so yeah, let me see what they wrote down. Um, well, first of all, minor note, but, uh, I think interesting nevertheless, uh, we are starting to see quite a few, uh, people sharing links of projects that they are working on. I've been scouting. Uh, I've been uh, looking at the um, at the showcase uh, ch Discord channel in the in the main uh, Zig Discord server. So uh, really nice to see people sharing what they're working on, and also useful because uh, I can put those links in the newsletter. So uh, if you um, don't feel like following everything, like if you don't feel like following the discussion press, uh, directly into Discord, you want a more relaxed way, uh, async an asynchronous way of following along uh, with what people are working on, or um, or in any case, you just want to create a list of interesting stuff to look at, take a look at the newsletter. Uh, I'll try to uh, put every interesting thing that I find there. Also, if you're a author of such links take a look uh you might have been featured uh right now the newsletter is not gigantic so i think we have uh roughly a hundred something subscribers so but still it's a small public i i think it's nice um so that's uh one minor thing uh second thing uh pretty cool uh if you remember we had a uh uh, a interest check for a group buy for Zig plushies and uh, the effort is moving along. We have a first preview of a zero plushie. So thank you to Nipsey for working on, on this and uh, organizing everything. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to receiving mine. Um, but yeah, so far, so good. I mean, that, that's amazing. I, I wouldn't even know where to begin to find a company able to uh, do plushies for us. So, cheers. Um, next. Um, <laughs> next. Oh, let, let's talk about uh, next showtime. So, uh, winter is coming and I, I'm running out of talks. So, uh, like the, the pool of remaining talks, I think it's actually basically almost empty i think there's just a couple of talks that haven't been um that people sent me that i haven't uh given them a slot for yet uh and that plus um the winter holidays coming up i think it's a good time to take a short break with this with the show so not today not this showtime but next showtime is gonna be the last episode of 2020 uh, we're going to come back in January. I don't know yet the precise date. Uh, I'll think about it as we get closer. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be uh, any content uh, coming on the stream or on the YouTube channel. I'm sure I'll, I'll come up with something. Uh, but yeah, no showtime. That said, uh, if you have uh, something that you want to talk about, uh, start thinking about making a proposal to restart Showtime. In any case, I'll need to have a pool of talks uh, and speakers, right? They want to come on stream to keep things interesting. Um, so yeah, just so you know, uh, even, there is, even though there is no Showtime, the, the, um, the process to, to get new talks can never stop. If I stop that, we die, <laughs> the show dies. So we need speakers. 
Um, uh, so uh, on, a, on a related note, um, if you check uh, Reddit, uh, you should know that uh, the advent of code is coming up again at, at the start of December, so pretty soon. And uh, the advent of code is basically, uh, there's this website, you go there, you'll find every single day there is a new code challenge that gets published and you can solve uh, you can solve the code challenge in whatever way, uh, with whatever language you want. And we have a private uh, leaderboard for this. And um, uh, we have a private leaderboard for this. And um, so yeah, ch check it out, sign up. Uh, see if you're interested, and if you're lazy like me last year, I knew about it, but I, I didn't I didn't do it. Uh, but and you want to see somebody else uh, struggle with basic exercises, maybe you want to check out the stream. I'll try to do uh, the advent of code live on Twitch. I think I'll try to stream every day or close to. Um, so yeah, if you want to to see a advent of code playthrough, uh, first time blindfold, uh, backseating allowed. And watch the stream. Um, and I think also that should be also something that can, pu can keep you interested, even though we don't have uh, showtime. Uh, we won't have showtime for a while. Oh, and you just sent me a link. So let me see if I can bring this up on screen. Of course, I'm not prepared uh, for this. Uh, <laughs> I, think I, I think this should work. Let me see. Uh, I'm almost there, I swear. Transform into the screen. Ooh, fast them. And we have a developer room at Fosdem. Finally, it took forever for them to announce everything. So apparently we are going to be at Fosdem, which by the way, you know what that means, right? <laughs> this means that there's going to be another call for speakers. <laughs> we need people also to come speak at, uh, at this event. Uh, I have to double check. So uh, thank you, Andrew, for pointing this out. Uh, I have to double check this. Uh, I signed up for a uh, half a day developer room. So uh, it should be a contained event that hopefully we can, uh, we will have enough effort to design properly and make it a, a good experience. And yeah, <laughs> what if there are vaccines by then? Uh, I don't think they're going to make these. I don't think they'll have the opportunity of making these uh, a physical event by then. I mean, I, they will probably have to start setting this up now. I, I don't know though, but um, yeah. But yeah, I'm looking forward to the day when there are vaccines and we can finally do something physical. <laughs> oh, by my error with the year. Oh yeah. No, no, it's gonna be pretty soon, Andrew. <laughs> Which, by the way, I think this means that you also should probably, maybe, you know, give a talk there. Well, we can discuss this later. <laughs> okay, uh, so I think we are done with the main introduction. I guess we can finally, finally present our first talk. So one second that I, that I can finish setting up everything. <clears throat> King is always thinking about what is the most efficient choice, the best path forward and the right move. Most of the time, he's actually thinking about Paladins, where he plays a variety of off-brand Overwatch heroes, but occasionally he also, he's also bringing in the same line of thinking to programming. You might remember him from his talk on locks and when he showed off Zap, uh, his event loop implementation. The title is Schedulers and Stuff. King, the stream is yours. Alrighty. So, yeah, as the title says, it's going to be anything, or almost not anything, but a lot of stuff related to scheduling. And so some background around me, I mostly do uh, 
just optimizing stuff. That's about it. But yeah, I focus in um in currency, memory optimizations like uh, data layout and allocation and collection, all that. And then also I/O like sockets and uh, I guess file I/O. There's many systems related stuff. And so over the terminology, um, it's probably important to know what we're talking about when I say scheduling. So like a scheduler is something that controls how work is executed. So like, um, I'll get into analogies later, but a worker is actually what executes task. And then the task itself is the work needed to be done. And so you can probably think of it like in a programming setting where there's a manager which is the scheduler, there's the developer, which is the worker, and then the task is like um, like a Jira task or whatever. That's probably a good analogy to use. And so there's different types of multitasking, which is um, how task like scheduled. The first would be preemptive. This is um, the most common for uh, programmers at least to understand kind of it basically where there's something else that's controlling when tasks start or stop instead of tasks themselves and so a common example is like the os scheduler so if your task runs too long then it's going to pause it and let something else run so it doesn't take up too much time uh the benefit of this is that no bad actors can run for forever and consume all the resources but the downside of it is that it requires resources on its own to manage them all and then stop them when necessary. So the other method of multitasking is cooperative scheduling, which is where the tasks themselves decide when to switch out. And so the scheduler just only needs to start them and then they can have the opportunity or the responsibility to stop them or do something else. So that is generally good for throughput because tasks can go all the way for how long they want to complete instead of having to be paused, which in a preemptive scheduler, that's more optimized for latency because everything gets an equal amount of turns. But um, work being paused makes it so that the time it takes to complete a work gets longer. And so another two terms that people probably confuse about is concurrency and parallelism. So like concurrency is being able to um sort of do multiple things but not really so like you're able to switch between multiple things to act like you're doing multiple things this is mostly how i think our brains work it's also how um how user interfaces are kind of because generally they're single threaded so but they also have different components interacting with each other so that means you're generally using some kind of concurrency where it's doing one thing, then starting on the next component, then the other and the other. So it's like switching between them. And then parallelism is the act of actually doing two simultaneous things at the same time. So it's like one person working on something, but switching between them is concurrency. But two people working on something, each doing their own thing is uh, in parallel. And so concurrency enables parallelism because it allows stuff to switch. And then when stuff can switch, they can switch to another person. And what that allows is that two people can work on two different things or the same thing. So in a scheduler, there's an idea of a run queue. So there's a running task, which is like the work actually being currently performed. There's a worker who's doing the work. And then there's a queue of other tasks waiting for their chance to be worked on. So a common example of this is um, in grocery stores, like there's a checkout line, people waiting for checkout or the task. When um, the person who is actually doing the checkout, like is paying for stuff, is a currently running task, and then thus uh, cashiers, like the worker. And so all you need for a scheduler is basically just one function, which is schedule. Well, all you need for a cooperative scheduler, because that's what we're going to be focused on. So all schedule does in this case is put some task onto the run queue. Uh, whether that's in front of it or that's the last of it, that's like a schedule by scheduler basis, but we're just gonna assume at the end because FIFO is generally the order once you think about stuff, at least I've come to assume. 
And so the complicated bit is how this interacts with the SIG async. So this is just my representation of async, um, at least how I learned to reason about it. It might differ, but I'll just walk through it either way. There's a lot of code to go through them. So when you do an async function call, it uses the returning variable or returning address to store the actual um, frame itself. And then it just starts the frame and runs until the first uh, suspension point. So that's what it's conceptually equivalent to. And so when you await, it's kind of similar where you're just waiting for the result by checking if it's done. And if it's not done, then you suspend and have it call you when it is done. So everything uh, async and sig is more completion based over polling, like it isn't something like uh, Rust or I don't know, maybe JS, where they use like iterators or pollers features. When it's here, you just tell what you want, and then something will eventually resolve that instead of when it's ready. And so one tricky little aspect of this is that in order to return values, the scheduler has to insert some code right at the end of the function to check for any awaiters. And if there are then, then it uh, resumes them. So that little bit is not actually triggered by anything um, code-wise. So it's a bit hard to understand uh, extra memory accesses if you look at a code gen or if you're doing like frame resource handling. And so that showcase async await, which you suspend or resume. And so we have to explain what suspend or resume do. So when Zig is compiling an async function, it generally creates a, a new function. And then it creates like a switch statement with all the suspend points interleaving. And so whatever data that needs, that one suspend point needs after the other is stored in a context or the frame data. And so it just ends up in like a function with the switch case and then the code for the suspension points in between all the switch cases. And so when you suspend, what you're doing is actually setting it so that the frame, when it is resumed later, will jump to the next switch case. And then it runs the code inside a suspend block. Uh, the reason that suspend has a block, because this is, I think, pretty confusing for the most part, as it's not really in other languages, the reason that suspend is has its own like execution block that runs after it updates the switch case is that because like think of it in a multi-threaded setting where you set the switch case and then you schedule the frame to be resumed. But there's a risk condition where um, if you schedule the frame to be resumed and then set the switch case using a suspend, then the uh, another thread could resume it before you suspend it and set the switch case. So then you were just jumping back to the original switch case instead of jumping after the suspend block. So there's a race there. And so that's why the suspend has its own code block, which runs after it sets the switch case. So that means um, it's safe to be resumed inside that block. And that's when you actually schedule it to be resumed. And so resume, pretty simple. It just calls the generated function with the frame. And then that does all the switch case dispatching and gets to the right place where it's suspended and continues on. And so we can use both of these to implement some sort of spawn function. Um, it's similar to like the go keyword and going. So what you start off with is making a decorator or like a wrapping async function. And what that'll do is first suspend and then schedule the frame. So this has the ability to Sorry. This has the ability to effectively reschedule it or yield. So you start the frame with a sync call at the bottom. It reaches the first suspend point, which is the first suspend here, which will schedule a frame. And so that when it continues after that suspend point, it's been scheduled onto like the run queue. So that means it's probably in another thread or it's on the same thread, but it's running. And then or it's running concurrently. And then you actually do the async function itself. And then you free the async memory because it was allocated. The reason there is a suspend for the free is because remember from earlier, 
the compiler has to insert some extra code at the end of an async function to resume anything that's awaiting it. But if you're about to free the frame, you don't want you don't want to touch the memory after because when it checks for awaiters, it has to check the frame and it dereferences it. So if you were to just free it and then return, it's going to free it and then try to resume an awaiter and that's going to seg fault. So you suspend to make sure that after that, it's not going to actually touch any of the frame. And then you do the actual freeing of the memory. So I think there's already a, an example of this in um, the current event loop in the standard library. Basically, I think it's called run detached. It implements this. So if you want like a concrete code example, it's probably best to go there. And so now we get into the multi third part. Um, the reason you'd probably want multi-threaded is just to be able to increase throughput because the original single-threaded queue was only one worker. And so that worker can only run one task at a time. And if there's a lot of tasks to run, that's going to take a longer time, I think, linearly. So what you want to do is get through the most tasks as possible. And so like the intuitive next step to that is just to add more workers to the same task queue, though. So this seems like a good idea because there's just more workers. So wouldn't it make sense that the line will get depleted faster? Uh, it does make sense, but not in the context of computers because as you can see, they're all going to the same task queue and that needs to be synchronized. And heavy synchronization or multiple workers racing to the same resource is what makes things slow in the land of CPUs. So in order to handle that contention, there's a few things we can do. And the idea behind it is just to decrease the amount of stuff people or two workers are trying to do at the same time that's shared between them. So we could have per local run queues for workers. So like each worker has its own queue and they only check there first. And if that's done, then they can check elsewhere. But if they're checking their own queue, that generally means that other people are checking their own, so they don't have to share the same queue and race with each other. Uh, another option we could do is reduce the amount of synchronization on the run queues themselves. Uh, this gets into the lock-free programming, which is its own topic, and probably can do a talk for that later. Wink, wink. But the last option is to reduce locking on the idle worker queue. So in addition to a run queue, which is all the tasks that needs to be run, there's also a queue of workers who don't have tasks to be run. And so when a new task comes in, it has to look for a worker to actually process it, use that, or it just puts it in a queue. So those are both places for synchronization because um, multiple workers can be checking if there's any other workers that need to do work. And so if there's multiple checking, there's multiple synchronization. And so you can reduce that. And so what happens when a worker runs out of work? Like I said earlier, he just goes into an idle work queue. But if there is, like, what does it do in the idle work queue? And I think there's two ways of resolving, um, or I guess, what does it do before going into idle work queue? And so one way is to ask another worker for work. This is like a something that makes sense, but also something that is probably very inefficient for general workloads. So what this means is that when I one's out of work, I have to ask another thread to schedule it when work comes by. And that process requires um, waiting for the other worker to acknowledge that request and then waiting for them to complete whatever tasks they're doing in order to wake you up. So there's a delay there, and it only really works if um, if the task that's being performed is like really short. There's less of a delay of them just working on the task than to see your message. But the upside of it is that um, you don't have to synchronize your own run queues, and I'll explain why you have to do that for the other option in a bit. But the synchronization, as I noted earlier, is pretty expensive, so 
less synchronization is generally better. Um, the other option is to just steal work from them without their um, acknowledgement. So this has the uh, effect of balancing work across all the workers without them having to um, interact with each other because, again, that would be slow. But it also means that um, they have to, every time they go to check their own local run queue, it has to be synchronized with others because others can be stealing at the same time. So it's generally more synchronization. But for modern processors, that seems to be like a decent trade off for performance. And so this is what it would look like in a um, shopping setting where there's multiple workers and each have their own queue and then tasks can go between workers if they want, which is like the work stealing. And so this is a type of thing that you actually see in grocery stores where there's multiple checkout lines and then each have their own line and people can move between them back and forth. So it's not something that's only unique to programming. It also appears in like real world uh, scheduling in general. Or like if you're working on a programming job, you just look at the board for your task and then you just pick one without having to uh, reconcile with other programmers. Not a form of work stealing. And so now we can get into the thing I'm working on, which is called Zap. So Zap is a multi-threaded work stealing general purpose task scheduler. And it's written in a way that tries to not have heap allocations, not have locks, and it's mostly like throughput oriented. So like it's good as a thread pool. It's basically just a thread pool. Yeah, it, it, it's it's just a thread pool, <laughs> but fast. And so I'll get into the points of those little asterisks on a no heap and the no locks. Basically, for the no heap is that all the memory that it uses is passed in by the user. So whether that's allocated in global space or on a heap or on a stack, it's up to them. So it doesn't require heap allocations. And for the lock or the no locks is it implements its own wait queue, which is basically what mutexes are or locks are. But um, that's why I put a little asterisk there because is it really no locks if you're implementing a lock kind of fish? So. It's up to you to decide, but there's no obstruction um, algorithms. That's a concept for lock free and wait free and all that. So that helps in scalability. Um, before I introduce the design of Zap, we can do a little demo of all the different types of one keys I've noted from before. So I have the code for this. I implemented a quick sort a multi-threaded quicksort, which is like a fork join pattern. So um, there's the partitioning, and then it does two frames, each to handle the low side of the queue and then the high end of the array, key and array. And so then it joins them all together at the end, using a wave. So it's a basic fork join kind of pattern. And then there's three schedulers that implement it for it. One is the single-threaded work queue from earlier, which is just as one thread and one work queue. We can actually go into the code of it, and it's pretty simple. I think a few lines of code. Basically, it pushes to a run queue, which is a list or a link list in this case, and just keeps popping them and resuming or doing the work or running the task. And so anytime we want to reschedule, we just stop the current task and then put it into the run queue so that it can eventually complete or continue after this. Spend. And so this is a single threaded uh, case. It's pretty simple. There's also the multi threaded case, which is the single run queue but multiple workers from earlier. And then here's the implementation for that. And then I also added a zap based version of it, which has its own monolith of code, which is the zap code base, which I'll explain in a little bit. But we can benchmark them now. So, like, Here's the baseline, which is the single threaded performance. So this is how it's scheduling tasks on a single thread. And then we have the threaded version, which is the shared run queue, but with multiple workers. And as you can see, even though we're actually using multiple threads here, it's actually kind of slower because that's mainly due to the cost of synchronizing on that shared run queue. So 
all the operations have to go through the same walk. And the cost of putting threads to sleep and waking them up and then coordinating all of that can get really expensive. But if you use a zap approach, which is uh, every worker has its own queue and only checks outside when it needs to, this can greatly improve the throughput because there's less synchronization. So we get the benefit of multiple threads without the drawback of all the synchronization that generally goes along with it. And so we can now look at why Zap is so fast. So there's like, I think, yeah, three main concepts in Zach, Zap. It's the task queues, which hold all the tasks that need to be run. So for each worker, it has its own little bounded queue of tasks, meaning it's limited, it's like a ring buffer, where the worker can push tasks to it and pop them, and then others can steal tasks from it. So like work stealing. It also has an unbounded queue, which is for when the bounded queue overflows, since it's a limited capacity. So when that's filled, then it goes to a separate queue, which is a based on Dmitry Vykov's um, MPMC or MPSC, which is an intrusive uh, linked list based queue. So uh, given it's a linked list, then it can hold as many uh, tasks as it needs without memory allocation. And to manage the workers themselves, there is an active queue. So the job of the active queue is just to hold a reference to all the currently working workers. And given it's a queue, it means that the it's a it's actually a stack consisting of all the workers intrusively provided. So they don't have to none of this requires heap allocation. The workers themselves are allocated on the workers thread stack. So uh, that's a way to avoid having to heap allocate stuff. And so all the workers that are currently running go in active queue. And that's used to find other workers to steal. And it's also used to synchronize shutting them all down because so, it has access to all of them. There's also the idle queue. It's where workers go when they saw that there's no work to perform. So they just go in a stack. And then when there is work to perform, then it um, pops from that stack and then tries to basically tries to find a uh, the next worker to work on tasks. And then there's the worker manager. I think this is the more innovative part of Zap, whereas the rest was just taking uh, existing algorithms like the Triber stack or Dimitri's queue or the queue and goat, the ring buffer and going, and just putting them all together. I think this one took uh, an actual effort into uh, designing. There's exists something similar in Tokyo, I believe, but not to the same extent because it still uses locks. So basically, there's one 32 bit integer that's accessed atomically using compare and swaps. So each state transition is done atomically, and there's no, there's no locks for synchronization, and there's no interruption. So it has the, the amount of idle workers inside encoded inside the bits as well as the amount of spawn workers so the added workers is to keep track of if there's anything to resume and then the spawned workers is to keep track of how many active workers there are as well as if it should spawn a new thread or if it just should um, resume an idle thread and so putting them all in the same integer means that anytime it wants to start a new thread it just has to load the atomic, which is really cheap. You just load and look at the amount of workers, and if something is already spawned, or if there's nothing that can spawn, then it just gives up there instead of having to require a lock, then check, and then release it, and have a bunch of those acquiring, checking, and releasing all the time, which is going to slow it down. So there's also the state at the end. So the state is basically a way to throttle the amount of workers that are st uh, starting and stopping, which is, um, it acts as a way to decrease synchronization. Yeah. And how it does that, it means it uses basically the concept of a waking worker. So I'll explain that. There's always only one worker that's in the state of waking at a given point. And if that worker finds work, 
then it start um, it makes another worker waking, so it can find work. But if it didn't find work, then it just goes back to sleep. And so, given that there can only be one worker waking at the same time, at, or at a given point in time, it means that there's only one worker that's um, being woken up, which is the expensive operation from the work requesting type of distribution. Um, what that prevents is all the workers trying to wake up to try and race on the same run queues and try and steal from each other, which is bad. And what it also prevents is workers checking for the run queues, seeing that they're empty, but they're really in the process of being filled, and then going to sleep and never actually having saw that it was filled up. So there's two states at the bottom called waking notified and suspend notified. Basically, waking notified means that um, there's currently a worker that's looking for tasks, but he hasn't found one yet. So if he goes to sleep, make sure he um, wakes back up because we create a new task. And then suspend notified is basically the same thing, but for when there's no waking workers. So th those effectively make sure that um, when a worker tries to look for work and fails to, that it doesn't miss a notification to wake up. And so that's the main algorithm step. Um, all the code, as usual, is available on GitHub. I have a few branches, a lot of branches in that repo, but the main ones are the um, Showtime branch, which contains the serial threaded and zap workload I showed earlier, which you can check out if you want to just see how schedulers work and understand the different stages of them. There's the branch that makes Zap usable as a zip library. So if you actually want to use Zap and start playing around with it. And then there's the Tombstone branch, which contains all my failed attempts at writing schedulers. So if you find that valuable or you want to learn from that, uh, go ahead. But hopefully you learn that it's all just a bunch of queues doing scheduling and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> wow <laughs> thank you king that was a very nice way of ending uh, the presentation um okay let's switch to the q a view then um whoa okay first of all i would i think i should say um thank you for actually Talking about async await and explaining how async await works in Z. Uh, there's been a lot of people asking about this stuff. Uh, I haven't, uh, I didn't have the courage of tackling the subject directly yet. So I've been no, searching. <laughs> I mean, I just, that's my case. Like, I remember you talking about having not using that way of uh, reasoning about it. So I'm not sure if that really resonated with other people. That's a that's a good question. So, um, I think that there is space for everything. Like the same way that maybe uh, I am right, and some people might prefer to might need something different to have the uh, light bulb um, turn on in their head. But I'm sure that there's other people that prefer that kind of explanation, and you probably just show them a precisely what they needed to see. So. Um, I guess we'll see what the feedback is. Uh, but in any case, uh, there's without any shadow of a doubt space for multiple different explanations and yeah, way of. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, well, that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, I let's see what people what questions people have. So, by the way, uh, if anybody has a question for Kim, please type it down in. Uh, Twitch chat or Discord or IRC. If you're in the Zig channel, I'm not in the Zig channel. Why am I not in the Zig channel? Uh, why is my client not connecting? Okay, maybe uh, IRC is <laughs> is out today um, for me. But um, yeah, uh, and please try to uh, tag me in the question so that I don't miss it. Uh, in the meantime, King, I have um, I have a question for you. So. And um, please correct me if I'm saying something wrong, but uh, I'm not a uh, huge Rust expert. 
I'm not a Rust expert at all, but I've watched recently uh, the talks that they had out there on async await because I was trying to research what to do uh, in our case, and I wanted to see what others had uh, put out in the meantime. Um, so I saw a couple of presentations about async await, and I saw that uh, in Rust they make a pretty big distinction between uh, and again, correct me if I'm using the wrong terminology, I might be remember, but I think they have a executor and a reactor, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the executor is supposed to be the, uh, the component that schedules tasks, while the reactor is a component that is supposed to basically react to uh, I.O. notifications and uh, stuff like that. So here's my question. They make this um, this distinction between these two uh, sub problems, let's say. While in our case, in the Z community, we always talk about the event loop, which is this thing that is supposed to kind of do both, both uh, juggle tasks, but also we say that it's the event loop that integrates with um, whatever notification API or or whatever. So my question for you is. Um, do you think the Rust uh, distinction between these two things is, would be viable for us? Do you think, are we going to give up some form of performance by trying to um, divide the problem into two separate sub-problems? Yes. So um, in Rust, the executor, uh, it goes both as basically a thread pool, but sometimes people use it to reference an executor which supports a reactor internally. So I think that's kind of what uh, the Zig current event loop is trying to be. Mm -hmm. um, as for the distinction, I currently make that distinction inside Zap. So like, if you go on the Showtime branch right now, the Zap code is actually under a file called Executor, because right now it's just a thread pool. But the distinction is pretty useful because it lets you use different APIs for different um, parts of the scheduler. So like APIs that only work with threads can sometimes be more efficient than APIs that uh, have to block threads using IO or something like that. But it's also a double-edged sword because um, having to block on a thread, then block on an IO on another reactor component, it's kind of actually slower because you're doing two syscalls. So there's benefit to actually like incorporating the two and so having the scheduler be powered by the same um, driver-ish thing that the reactor is powered by, and then integrate them together, that can reduce the amount of actual syscalls being performed, which I haven't played around with, but I'm guessing that can uh, increase performance. So I'll have to try it out eventually. OK. Um, so in other words, then you, uh, if I remember correctly, also from your presentation, you then aim for ZAP to eventually become both, right? Uh, because you yeah. want to cover I.O. and stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to add like I.O. timers, eventually like signals and process stuff, the whole deal. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I was curious because we, um, we don't have this terminology anywhere around and... Uh, and who knows, maybe this is something that is good uh, to steal. Uh, okay, let's see. I think we have a couple of questions. Um, all right, one is from Felix. Uh, King, will you provide doodles for the official Zig documentation explaining concepts? Uh, maybe if you want some. I don't know if these doodles are good, though. <laughs> They're like things that I drew up in like some web view thing. Just pasted them in. Yeah. King, I think people love your doodles, you know? Uh, yeah. You have to accept this fact, yeah. Uh, I, just, I don't think they're like up to quality. I want like someone really good at art to try and make one to see what that turns out into. Oh, okay. So somebody trying to polish your concept. Yeah, mm -hmm. like the polish. Yeah. Well, honestly, I think that the, the handmade quality to them is part of the appeal, at least for me. Um, and, I, and I think like... The, I, I don't... I think this is so prominent in your design that people don't care about the different, slightly different background color and the dots. Like when I did a blog post, for example, I didn't clean your doodles up in any way. I just put them there as they were and uh, nobody complained. I think I only saw, I, I genuinely only saw positive comments. I, I, I swear 
if I saw a single negative comment about it, I would tell you. Uh, but I didn't. Uh, people love them. Uh oh. <laughs> um, okay, so we have a question from Andrew. Um, is using atomic uh, load store compare and swap problematic, or only actual or only actual contention on lock? Um, the problematic bit is there's two problematic bits actually. The first is when two uh, CPUs try to CAS or compare and swap at the same time. The one that fails has to uh, go back into memory to fetch the new value again, and so. Um, that part is the slow part, actually going back to memory and then having to synchronize all the caches of the CPUs that are trying to cast at the same time. So like, if you have a atomic swap and there's like um, 128 cores doing the same atomic swap on the same memory, you can probably have delays of like an order of milliseconds just for that single instruction. So yeah, there's cost in atomics, but there's other cost in um, putting a thread to sleep. So like in a locks case, if you have a spin lock and the work completes really quickly, it doesn't have to put the thread to sleep. So that can actually be faster than doing a bunch of atomics where they're contending again. But if like if the thread being if the thread that's doing work gets put to sleep, that means others have to wait. And then the process of waiting is actually the slow part because it's this call. And that takes like a few microseconds. So there's two, there's two like uh, competing overheads for locking, whereas in atomics is just one. And there's ways to kind of mitigate that. Mm -hmm. uh, so Andrew has a follow up question then. Um, yeah, is it free to do a compare and swap if there is no contention? Uh, quote unquote free. Uh, for modern CPUs, basically. So like a compare and swap without contention on my current Zen Plus CPU is like 10 nanoseconds. Uh, an atomic store is like one or two. So yeah, it's a cost of a few memory instructions. So it's basically free. The only expense of fire is just when more people start trying to do the same thing on the same memory. OK. So King, are you? Are you ready for uh, benchmarking up on a, yet another platform? I am. I think Hayes had a M1. I don't know if he ran Zap on it, but I'm pretty curious to see how they're going to perform there. Yeah, I, I think there are also some differences between the um, uh, TTKs. Oh, no, but Hayes has an actual uh, Air, I think. or No, he got a 13-inch MacBook Pro. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Pro. So, he got the Air. Oh, he got the air. Uh, I'm not sure actually. I don't know which one. No, oh, I think he got the pro. A lot of money on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, well, uh, I'll be able to help um, too uh, soon, hopefully, um, and not just me, but also a few people more. So, yeah, looking forward to benchmark Zap. Oh, yeah. Also, Jacob in chat uh, is ready to bench uh, yeah. Zap for you. Not everyone is a CI. More CIs, please. <laughs> Um, okay, I let me double check if I miss any question anywhere, too, but I don't see any other mention of me, so I think we're good. Um, is there anything else, King, you want to say before we move forward? Um, check out Zap, try and use it. I need more um, real life examples because all I have are really benchmarks, so it'd be nice if people started playing around with it, see what's broken, see what they want out of it. That's what sort I of do. Right. That, yeah, that's make a lot of sense. And uh, we we need to uh, progressively start uh, also uh, trying to incorporate async await uh, in the programs that we make. And I swear, th by the way, thank you for this talk. I think this was a, a nice addition to the available materials on async await. And I swear I will also add more to the list in, in the near future. I just need to be done with the website first. <laughs> Um, later. Yeah. So uh, thank you again, King. Uh, and now we can move to uh, to the break. We're gonna have after the break a group chat between Jacob, Frank, and Andrew on um, 
what's going on with Apple Silicon and uh, how all languages are scrambling to start supporting it, the good things, the bad things, uh, and everything in between. So uh, you can go watch XQC if you want now. I know he's back, so enjoy yourself. You have the minutes. Uh, see you on the other side.
uh, okay, we are working on it. It just give us a couple of minutes more, so we we make sure that uh, everything is set up properly. Uh, apparently, Jacob is on the new ARM uh, Mac, and he's trying to make Discord work there. So, yeah. So hello and welcome to the second half of Showtime. Uh, please, this is time to come back from the other tab where you're in or whatever. Uh, also, if you have a friend uh, that is interested in this stuff, uh, it's time also to uh, give them a link to the show uh, because this is not going to happen very often, I fear. Uh, today we have a few people that have been working on all the Apple Silicon stuff uh, for Zig and uh, these are all interesting times and so uh, I guess it's time for me to introduce them and kick off this um, second half of the show which we titled Pirates of Apple Silicon which is a reference to a movie that if you haven't seen you should probably see. Uh, so our first uh, guest uh, that I'm going to present is Andrew, Andrew Kelly, so you probably know him from uh, this programming language called Zig. So hello, hello everybody. <laughs> Hi. Then uh, after Andrew, we have uh, Frank Denise. So uh, yeah. Jedi Sector One. Hello, hey, everybody. Frank. And hello. finally, we have uh, Jacob. Uh, oh, Frank, feel free to stay on webcam. Don't worry. Hey, uh, works. <laughs> yeah, it works. So Jacob is from the actual Apple Silicon Mac. Crazy. Yeah, I'm running on ARM now. So it is crazy, actually. Yeah, don't, sh don't shake your your head. Andrew is pretty crazy. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we already have a. I've got, I've got no software, pretty much, because nothing works. So. Mm -hmm. no. uh, okay, just uh, a quick reminder for the people uh, for our guests, uh, guys. If you want to keep uh, Twitch chat open. Feel free to do it so that you can read comments in, in real time. Up to you what you want to do. Uh, we already have a comment by Matt that he, <laughs> he said uh, to Andrew, sick walls, bro. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> okay. These things, can I, can I talk about that for just 10 seconds? Sure. Because these things come with these little tiny sticky things, but there's no way to take it off. So you have to do this painstaking process and you just put five on each one. And it took me... It took me many hours to put these panels up. Yeah, just wait until they start uh, detaching us from the wall. That <laughs> happens too. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so uh, yes, um, <clears throat> we can start. I prepared a short introduction uh, for the topic uh, so that people can get up to speed. Uh, it's not going to be super serious, but then after I'm done with this, uh, we're going to start with the actual serious talk. So. <clears throat> The year is 2020, and a lot of weird things are happening, from the big and obvious ones down to the technology world, where Apple has just released Apple Silicon, a new architecture with amazing performance. 
Now, has Apple really punched more in the face and given us room for at least five more wasteful layers of software abstraction? Or was our perception distorted all along by the constant gaslighting by Intel, who had a stranglehold on the market and, pretend, and preferred chalking the competition over improving the design of their CPUs until the strategy quite literally melted down? Well, posterity will judge. In the meantime, back to Apple, new CPU. That's a good thing, right? Well, it's Apple we're talking about, so there's always a few buts. First of all, uh, it's a system or a chip, which I'm sure at some point an Apple exec must have described as a good opportunity for us to make third-party repair even harder. The SoC incorporates a CPU with eight cores, a GPU, a neural engine, which is basically the modern equivalent of a math coprocessor, and of course also the main memory. So as long as nothing breaks, we're fine, right? Well, almost. Apple decided to take one of the extra five layers for themselves and added a code signing requirement to all executables and share libraries running on uh, Apple Silicon. So if your executable doesn't have a valid signature, it gets killed by the kernel. Today, we're going to chat with the fine people that have been tackling this problem in order to allow others like me to use Zig, because yes, despite all the sarcasm, I too bought one of the new Macs because I still think it's the best choice for me, at least for now. So, uh, how was this introduction? Too much? I don't know. That's good, it's good. Well, thanks for uh, th thanks for thanks for that. Uh, yeah. Well, so I just want to talk a little bit about how the Zig project itself th thinks about this platform. So, for me, I, I have a, I have sort of a bigger perspective where I'm thinking about Mac OS, but I'm also thinking about Windows and FreeBSD and Linux and um, any operating system that any of our users want to use. And so, from from my perspective. I want to provide a development experience for everyone that works the same to the extent that is possible on every platform. So for example, um, one thing that, that Zig is able to do is, is cross-compile. but And I want that to work everywhere. So I want you to be able to be on Windows, cross-compile for Linux. I want you to be able to be on Linux, cross-compile for Windows. But the same thing goes for Mac OS. I want you to be able to cross-compile using your Mac OS dev machine for other operating systems. I also want you to be able to cross-compile targeting Mac OS on the other ones. So from my perspective, I just want all of the things that you can do in Zig to work everywhere. That, that's, that's how I'm coming at this. Um, so as far as, uh, as, as far as these new changes by, by Apple are concerned, my attitude is like, OK, what new problems do we have to solve to maintain the development experience on this, on this new platform? And um, but the thing is, I do want to support this other platform because, you know, if you look at the ziglang.org website, the the tagline says that it's a general purpose language, and to me, what that means is you can use this language for any programming project. You can use it with any hardware, and you can use it for any processor, uh, and you you it will it will it will be a language that you can solve for a wide scope uh, of different kinds of use cases, including 64-bit ARM on Mac OS. OK, thank you, Andrew, for the introduction. So uh, let's uh, see what Frank has to say. So Frank, uh, uh, well, people from uh, Showtime should know, uh, should know you already. If they didn't knew you before, you know, I think you're uh, already more famous than all of us in here. <laughs> uh, but I think I'm bringing this up in, in this case more precisely because uh, you have been, uh, you maintain various open source projects, right? So uh, like Libsodium and um, so what's uh, what's the whole Apple Silicon deal like? And uh, also since you had to maintain uh, all this software, uh, I know that you got a development transition kit from Apple a while ago. Uh, how was working with it? So yeah, I maintain a bunch of projects, uh, mainly around cryptography and security and privacy. And what they all have in common is the fact that people want to use them on Apple devices, not just on Mac OS, also on iPhone and everything. So I noticed that whenever Apple announced a new version, a new major version of their operating system, they tend to break stuff. API break, 
or they introduce new requirements for developers. What by requirements, for example, I mean signatures. This is something that we had to do uh, just because whenever you download something using a web browser on a Mac, it's going to be quarantined. And if you want to run an application that's been quarantined, users will see a pop-up saying, hey, do you want to run this? And of course, you can tell users, like people who already trust you, hey, this is safe, just ignore the warning, say, OK. But people eventually want everything to be signed. They don't trust you if this is not signed. So it turns out that to sign something, you need to register for an Apple developer account. And then you need to use Apple-specific tools to do that. And your applications need to be signed both by you using your own key and by Apple, which is OK. And then they introduce another requirement later, which was notarization. This is essentially some kind of static analysis that Apple does just to verify that your executable is not going to do some shady stuff. This is not bulletproof, but still, you have to do it. If you don't do it, you still get the pop-up. So Apple likes to introduce new things that developers have to go through every time they want to release something, which is why when they announced Big Sure, I was like, OK, this is going to break things. This is going to introduce new requirements. So just to get prepared, whenever they announced the DTK, which is a development platform for ARM, I registered for getting one. So this is a Mac Mini with some ARM CPU. This is not the M1. This is a slower CPU. But it was still a great platform to test the software on and also to test software on Big Sure. And I was, at first, pleasantly surprised because anything written in C or C++ or Swift, essentially anything that you can compile using Xcode, worked pretty much out of the box, which was a very nice surprise. No big API breakage. There was some breakage, for example, uh, the way dynamic libraries are provided is slightly different. So for Zig, we had to do a couple tweaks to get it to run. So these were tweaks mainly for Big Sure itself, not specifically uh, for the ARM version of it. And once we had this uh, running on Big Sure for x86, 64, it was pretty straightforward to have Zig actually work on Apple Silicon. So that was really cool. And it was great news. Everything seemed to work perfectly. Until a pretty late version of the Big Sure operating system, I think it was right before the first release candidate, things started to fall apart. Whenever you wanted to start something, half the time, your executable got killed with a signal nine. So you wanted to run Python, poof, signal nine. So when I noticed that everything was in a pretty weird state, I was like, OK, maybe this is my DTK. Maybe my operating system is totally uh, in a bad shape. And I was talking uh, to Jacob about that, and he didn't notice the same thing. Everything was working perfectly on his system. So OK, so far, so good. It has to be me. But after an update, eventually, everybody was seeing exactly the same issue. Things were just killed by the system. Nothing in log file, nothing, just kill with a signal 9, which was very frustrating. So it turns out that in order to work on this problem, uh, you have to go through another requirement, which is that every single executable, including shared libraries, has to include a hash of itself which is kind of weird, especially since this is just a hash. This is not a signature, so anybody can compute a hash. Plus, this is something that only happens on Apple Silicon. With exactly the same version of Big Sure on other platforms, you didn't see the same problem. So that was a little bit weird. And at first, at first my reaction was like, OK, that has to be a bug. This is gross. I don't know why Apple would do something like that. This is, doesn't make any sense it will be fixed in the next version. Of course, it wasn't fixed. It's still around. As of today, I have no idea why this is uh, something that happens only on ARM CPUs and not on other CPUs. This is still weird.
but you have to go through it. So um, this is one of the reasons why most of the languages, besides the ones provided by Xcode, just don't work on Apple Silicon yet. If you want to run Go, it's not going to work, even though you can cross-compile to ARM for, uh, for OS X already. That works, but it's not going to run because it's not going to, to be consigned. Rust didn't work until very recently. And by re very recently, I mean last night. And this is just for a nightly version. And they went through a pretty ugly workaround, which is using the system linker, which is what we did originally. So yeah, there's still a bunch of things to, to do to cope with Apple requirements. And I think that Jacob is going to tell us a little bit more about them. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Frank, for uh, yeah this quick recap. Um, yeah, what a mess. I, by the way, so let's continue with uh, the main presentation so that we can show the full state of things. But later, I want to ask you to please try to make a try to think of a good reason for Apple to do this, because I think we are, uh, at least I'm baffled by this choice and I can only put my tinfoil hat on and think that uh, this is like the prelude for a new Apple tax that's coming for to, uh, to everybody. <laughs> but, but I hope there might be other interpretations. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hear that for you later. Okay, Jacob. So uh, I guess it's finally time for the main star of this show to uh show us you mean the demo yeah show <laughs> us the me, demo not me. <laughs> so what are you <laughs> no actually you are really the star so you have been uh busting your ass you. doing this stuff so please tell us how much effort you put into it and how far you got um so yeah so um andrew knows that knows this very well because i've been i've been ranting to him for the past two or three weeks i don't really remember um uh, and Frank as well. I've just been messaging them, going like, "This is insane. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening. I hate this. I hate Apple. I just want to throw everything out." Um, as Frank said, actually, there is nothing like this um, embedded within the kernel on x86 64. For some reason, it's only on Apple Silicon or ARM 64. Um, I think I think it might be some integrity checks. Um, Frank will be able to tell you more about this, but um, it looks like it because. So one of the interesting things that we noticed um, with Andrew and then actually we, oh yeah, this is kind of exciting. So I was ranting so much and I was shouting so much, but actually Apple wrote to us. So Apple engineer with some high up engineering manager actually pinged us an email, like a week ago or something, um, telling us, hey, you know, we can help you. Obviously, he has helped. well, I, I really appreciate this stuff. It's just that by that time, I went through everything that he's, he, he suggested basically I had a look at everything that, that was there. Even the um, Apple open source, he also mentioned that all of this stuff that's been added, it's not out yet. <laughs> um, they still have to sift through it before they actually release it. I don't know why it's meant to be open source, but you know, never mind. Um, so, um, so yeah, um, there's a couple of changes. Um, the most important thing um, is the fact that, I mean, for us, this is a bit of a problem, but I guess we'll have to like live with it anyway, is the fact that it has to be a pie. So it has to be every binary and um, shared library, of course, but um, binary as well, has to be a position independent executable, meaning that um, this very clever trick that Andrew came up with for incremental linking is just not going to work because um, the kernel doesn't like it. And that's it. So, um, um, so that was the first thing. So we had to figure out how to actually go about up, like not using absolute addressing at all in the linker. Um, the next thing was, as Frank mentioned, code signing. Um, this was the most baffling thing because I still don't get it. Um, I, I mean, I implemented this stuff and it works and it signs the binaries and it works, but I have no idea why they added it. No clue. Um, I'll show you guys what uh, that it runs and incremental linking as well. Mm -hmm. um, so as Frank mentioned, it's essentially like a. Are you a showing your screen, where... Jacob? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, let me know um, when you do because I might not okay. notice. Thank you. Okay, so um, now I'm just gonna so I'm gonna run for a bit and then I'm gonna share the screen. If okay. you don't mind? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I didn't want to pressure you. I just I need to vent out. You know, it's been like two weeks. Or <laughs> please, weeks, please so do take to... your time. Um, yeah. So with the hashes, it's actually you have to. Oh, and this this is great. So in ARM, uh, every page is 16 kilobytes. Um, on x86 64, it pro probably some of you have noticed it's only four kilobytes, right? So um, when we actually um, create a Maho um, binary, we have to basically 
uh, have have everything aligned in 16 kilobytes pages. Awesome. Okay, uh, that was one of the things I was missing, and it actually wasn't explained anywhere. And I totally forgot about this. Um, but with code signing, you split it into four kilobytes pages. So and nobody can explain to me why. I don't. So we're code signing for ARM, and we we have to segment that for, in, for into four kilobyte segments rather than 16 kilobyte segments, just to make the binary bigger. For some god, for I don't know. I just I, yeah. So that's what you do. You come. You then calculate the uh, uh, SHA two five six, and that's it. That that's basically what code signing is. Um, this is not the end of the story here because um, if you do any sort of in place patching of the binary, uh, and this is actually what uh, most of languages had a problem with. That's Go. Um, I think Rust as well. That's why they they went the system linker. It turns out that if you modify the binary or anything. The inode gets cached by the kernel, and if you do anything to it, everything is invalidated, and you get sick kill nine. Um, so a resolution to this is basically a copy and rename. Um, and, and thanks to Lemon Boy, he actually he showed me that you know my code I, I don't know like twenty lines or something can be written in like one line, and that was that was beautiful because um, uh, Zig is so nice that copy. I think copy file does everything for you. But basically, we have to do this. This is insane. Like we can't patch in place. Even if I recompute the code, like the code signature, what I do, that doesn't matter. The kernel will still kill you because the I know is saved somewhere. So you either reboot or you copy it over. It's it's yeah. Uh, Homebrew had so many problems. It's fixed now. But Frank remembers. I was basically I, I wanted to shoot somebody because um, I had to manually after every single installation like of Dialects or something. I had to run like a find and then you know, recalculate the code signatures and copy everything over. I was like, why? But anyway, right. Um, let me share my screen. <laughs> so that was the, that was the, a bit of a runt. Okay. Um, can you guys see this? And I'm asking here, Andrew and then, and, um, and, and Frank, if you could confirm that everybody can see this. Is that okay? Yep. So, cool. right. So, um, so first of all, I've got like, uh, as I already told guys, I've got unsolicited um, demo here as well that I actually kind of hacked together today. Um, before I get onto this, let me show you that actually stage two can do this now. So that's been marked, I think, yesterday. So uh, thanks for review, Andrew. That was very useful. Um, so there we go. This is, um, uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, this is the stage two. Um, it's pretty fresh. So let's do the um, the cool stuff. Oh, sorry. I'm going to show you first what um, the hello is. So there we go. Um, it's essentially the same thing we have on x86.64. I'm not using, actually, I don't actually use any weak or lazy symbols yet. So I actually don't use the calls from, from lips yet. Actually, you know, we use the, we use syscalls directly, which we shouldn't. But you no, know, whatever. It's uh, it's 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 the first step forward anyway. Yeah, Jacob, so, let me just add yeah. one thing for the people that might be watching uh, on on YouTube later. So this is sure. not how normal Zig programs look like. You're not always supposed to just use assembly I mean, line. <laughs> for me, they look like this nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is the uh, an example they're supposed to run in the self hosted compiler, which is still a work in progress. And the self hosted compiler doesn't support yet the uh, full syntax of Zig. So when testing, developers uh, working on the stage two compiler use simplified examples where they use inline assembly basically to jump over uh, Parts of the language that are not yet implemented. Yeah, please continue. Okay, cool. Right. So, um, so thank you, Lars. Yes, that's that's, that's correct. Um, uh, so uh, this is the equivalent of um, "Hello World," just written for ARM, um, specifically targeting Apple Silicon. Then again, there, there isn't that much um, like arcane knowledge here. Here, I think the only thing is this: is that um, so SVC is the equivalent of Cisco. Uh, if you target Apple Silicon or, or, or Mac OS, you have to. So the, um, the, the immediate here is actually uh, 18 hex. That's it, right? So um, in register 16, we're sticking um, the Cisco number for write. Then uh, we have DFD, the file descriptor that we want to write to, which is 2 which is 1. Then the pointer to the message, and then the length of the message, right? There's absolutely like no magic here. And then exit is. Basically, the exit Cisco, so that's um, Cisco number one, and uh, exit. Well, we're gonna succeed, right? Zero. I, I usually actually stick in forty-two just for fun, but but then you know, obviously, you have that something fail. Anyway, so this is very simple. 
Um, so let's do, so for those of you who have actually not seen stage two in action, we do have a thing called uh, incremental linking. Uh, I was gonna say that it's actually something different than compilation, like incremental compilation, because we actually do in-place patching. Well, in, in case of Apple Silicon, we actually cheat you in a way that we, we do some in-place in patching, but then we have to copy stuff over, but you won't see it because um, we're that sneaky, right? So um, hello, Zig. And then if you do watch, then basically you you can then do update and re, re, um, re -compute, like recompute all only those symbols that changed or, or those sections. Um, not everything is implemented yet, so you might very easily break this stuff, but um, some things. Uh, but you know, we're, we're gonna work on them. So um, there we go. We should see the um, hello. Um, so this works. Um, this is um, native executable. Just to prove you that I'm not lying, I'm actually I'm actually running natively, not via Rosetta. So so everything is awesome. Now let's do a quick tweak here. So let's print the message twice. And this is the power of of I guess Zig's incremental linking. I don't think anybody's got it. And this is this is this is absolutely brilliant. We just do update, and you can see that actually the list of um, of operations is actually much, much shorter than it was. Obviously, I recompute the code signature in full. I don't think we have to because we've got a lot of um, like zero padded space. And I'm pretty sure the hashes, well, the hashes won't change, right? So we could probably just, just um, cache that as well somewhere, but that's for the future. Anyway, so, um, and there we go. Works as well, right? So we can actually have fun here and change the message as well in the pointer. Uh, that's what plus three, 17, I think. Update, a bit more change, and there we go. Okay, and we can just keep going and, and you know, and on and on and on. So um, all of this stuff, um, so this is actually, this is a pie, um, I mean, sorry, you guys are gonna see probably yourselves, which I probably shouldn't do, right? Um, no. There is this thing called macro view. Um, and it's a pretty nifty tool. Uh, it works only on, on Mac, unfortunately, um, but it basically puts everything into perspective. And if you're debugging, you know, if, if, if all you get from the kernel is that something got killed, that's not very useful. Um, you could probably debug the kernel, but then again, you need another Mac to do this. So I'm not sure whether there's an, like any marketing strategy there that to debug your Mac or the kernel, you have to get another one, but you know, we're gonna get there. Um, so yeah, there you go. We've got the code signature. Um, you can see that a lot of the hashes is actually the same. That's because we've got lots of zeros here. Um, um, that's because we actually we we do uh, we do pad it um, for the future um, recompilation purposes, so that we don't have to extend the sections and move them around because that's you know that requires a lot of um, reason, right? So we don't you know we want to shave shave off the number of syscalls to the bare minimum. Um, and that is the code, uh, the assembly here. And um, I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail here, but basically we, so instead of having like absolute addressing, we kind of, what we have here in, in, in God, instead of storing the addresses, we actually store instructions uh, at the moment too. So we still fit in eight bytes. It's essentially a jump table, a relative a jump table. So on x86.64, it's done the same way. So you're also going to get a pie. And it's using the um, rip relative addressing, whereas um, on 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 ARM it's obviously PC relative. But um, anyway, and if everything is relative now, okay. So um, we kind of saved the day, I guess, a little bit in the sense that you know we didn't have to go for um, embedding the actual jumps within the assembly of um, text itself, like the the actual uh, code itself. Instead, we actually have it in the gods. So we don't have to change everything every every single time. Okay, cool. So um. So that was the that was the incremental linker. Um, <laughs> what I did today, and if there is any LLVM that is watching, please don't hate me. I promise that I will try my best to port this stuff to LLVM itself. I didn't yet. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, so as Frank pointed out, and Rust with Rust, they swapped the um, LLVM LD64 for the system linker, and that's what we did as well. Um, essentially speaking, if you do um, export this variable, set it to one so that it's actually there, um, you we also swap 
um, the um, LLD for the system linker. But this is not cool. Um, so actually, um, believe it or not, but so this is the standard um, zip code, right? This is, uh, as Lawrence mentioned, this, this is what you, what you normally write. You don't write inline assembly. Um, so bear with me here. Um, I'm not cheating you. This actually works. So as you can see here, we are using LD64. So this is the LD linker. And um, well, guess what? It works. So I, um, I I did what I promised Andrew I would. Or maybe I didn't. Maybe I said I won't. I can't remember. <laughs> um, but basically, um, I, I, I do like, so after the LD spits out the um, binary, I did the patching myself. So I um, I created the code signature. I, uh, parsed the, I parsed the macro back. I calculated the hashes. I, I put them back in and then did the copy trick. And there we go. So um, essentially speaking, maybe maybe we could for 0 0.7.1 use LD itself rather than using um, system linker hack for wow. some basic stuff. So okay. basically instead of, uh, so uh, let me see if I got this right. There are basically the normal option for code signer and executable is to call the code sign utility or use the system linker, which basically kind of does the same. Maybe it doesn't call out a different process, but uh, yeah. you know, they use Apple stuff. While you basically wrote code sign dot zig. Is that? Uh, yeah, essentially. Yeah, because we already have it, right? So right. I just basically, I, uh, so for those of you who might know, I, I'm, I'm working on this um, kind of like macro, like terminal based macro view called Zacco. I, um, I'm really bad with naming. Um, so sorry for this. Um, it's basically Zig's um, macro parser, and I just do the code in. I put it in the the linker itself here, um, and after the run with LD64, I just I call it, I parse it, I, I I scan the file. I you know it's it's very easy to add this stuff provided that there's enough padding. Um, I allocate the the space for the code signature, then calculate the hash, all this crap. Put it in, then there, there we go. So actually, um, and there is another thing. I didn't actually, I didn't have enough time today to do this, but um, and I thought we didn't, we didn't actually, um, so with Andrew, we actually we got really close to be able to cross compile for uh, Mac OS X eighty six sixty four, like really close, because we got the headers out. Um, we actually shipped them right now, but there is this problem with um, LVM's linker that you can only link to lib system if you're on Mac OS. Uh, which you don't need to. I mean, with the frameworks, we're gonna have to probably, you know, try a bit harder. But for lib system, it's actually pretty easy. And we can also do this patching here. I know this is not the ideal solution. We should probably, you know, we we definitely need to backport this to LVM if nobody else does. But um, but it's possible. So hey, there you go. Right, rant is over. Sorry, like I'm gonna switch this back. Do no screen sharing. Wait, there we go. <laughs> so yeah, um. I should probably say, so I should probably say, because um, uh, your birthday was like, I don't know, Andrew, a couple of weeks back. So yeah, happy birthday. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wait, so you actually are, you are, we're, we're running the LLD linker and then it finishes the job, but it's not finished. Then Zocco code loads it again, does the code signing, fixes the, well, you're, not yet, but you're, you're thinking this is the next step. Fix yeah, the yeah. L system. Yep. Holy crap! So we're gonna have the ability to cross compile for Mac OS after that. Yeah, we should. Yeah, we just need to extract the headers as well because, you know, I didn't have time to do this, and it's pretty boring. So I'm gonna leave that to you. <laughs> oh, fair enough. <laughs> wow, what a great birthday present! Wow. Okay. Nice. Holy cow! That is that is a lot of work. So. So yeah, Frank. Sorry, I'm just gonna quickly. So yeah, Frank, we're better than Rust now. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. Um. So let me see. We have. Uh, we want to make sure to. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. I every single time this bug Discord. God damn it. Uh. Okay. Let me make sure that we don't forget. Uh. To mention. We don't forget to skip pieces. Okay. So. Um. But Jacob. Uh. From the point of view of performance, how does it feel to you? I know this is still an incomplete state, so maybe uh, if you don't feel ready to comment on this, um, just say so. But um, 
Previously, the, well, the general idea of incremental linking is we are not even rewriting the entire executable, right? We are just writing mm -hmm. chunks of it. And that seems great. But then to make this stuff work on macOS, uh, now we need to recompute a signature, uh, copy and paste the file twice. Um, do you see these uh, impacting the performance of incremental linking in a way that kind of detracts from the expected user experience? Uh, well, not yet, because um, you know the stuff I'm working on is pretty small. So the, when we're gonna get to like bigger projects, I'll probably notice it then. Um, but we can still like optimize that anyway, because it's it's basically so we are still doing in place patching. It's just that we have to go through this additional hoop of the code signature plus copy and rename, mm -hmm. and that's it. So basically, a couple more syscalls. But um, other than this, the the, the um, Andrew's brilliant idea of the God table. Actually, I called it Zig God because um, oh, there's another thing I had to um, I had to twist. Um, I initially had it, and, and this is this is another thing actually. Um, X and new kernel on Apple Silicon is really picky about. Is about having proper um, protection flags set on each segment. So protection flags basically um, they describe what the segment is meant to use for. So you know the text traditionally and, and 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 because the naming actually doesn't matter it can be called whatever you want but um traditionally text is where you have the executable code and that's why it has to start with execute and read data is for all, all your all your like statics or globals and it should be um uh read and write and then the link edit which is basically this one's got all the crap that link uh the, the dyld so the the loader is actually using um, the space four is, uh, I think it's read initially, and then it bumps up to 203. Um, so basically, initially, we had the got in the data section. But we can't now, because they're not addresses. They're actually instructions. So we have to have it in the text section. So it has to be part of the executable segment. Um, and that was one of the things I had to, 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 to change. But it's fine. I mean, uh, it, it, to be honest, it really does, doesn't really matter. Um, with ARM, we're going to have to um, uh, like work a bit harder on the actual assembly itself because the jumps, even relative jumps, are not that easy. We don't get uh, we don't get that much uh, leeway as we do with x86, 64. We don't get like 32 bits. Basically, we if you if you want to jump like a couple of pages, we have to from like I think two instructions and one because we have to jump to a page and then from within a page we have to do a relative like small jump or something. We'll get there. So, um, so I think, I think no, I think we're gonna be fine, um, except for the additional syscalls. But I think that should be should be fairly minimal. So, uh, so I'm I'm optimistic. I'm really optimistic. Do you expect Apple to ever come out with like a new syscall that basically says flush the code signature for this inode? Oh no, hell no, I'm, no. <laughs> okay. I I no, I, I strongly doubt that. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you for the exposition, but also thank you for your work. Uh, clearly, I think everybody here uh, is going to benefit from that, especially because if cross compilation works, then that means that when your Mac craps out because of the latest change that uh, Apple did, at least you can make do uh, with cross compilation. So um, that, that's good. <laughs> uh, and I so actually, it would be, yeah. be worth. Yeah, it would be easier for us as well, right? Because nowadays we would basically the way we had uh, Zik compiled to ARM sixty four available for zero seven was because you know um, I did it on the DTK and it's, this is pretty annoying and I'm pretty sure CIs will not um, catch up for a very long time. So generating binaries uh, automatically is going to be um, difficult unless we have good cross compilation. Right. Right. Um, okay, so let's uh, call an end to the main part where we do the main exposition and explain the whole situation. And uh, I would like uh, for Andrew to just give us a final recap. So we now discovered uh, just now that uh, we're going to have cross compilation. That's awesome. But I think people want to know in general. So uh, is Zig Stage 1 going to be working for Ma for the new Mac app uh, platform and everything else? So what can people expect uh, from the Zig project, Andrew? Yeah, um, so, well, before, I, I want to, I'll answer your question, but I also just want to address some of what uh, Jakub was just talking about. Yeah. Uh, so I want to point out that um, if if we get hot code swapping working, 
that can still work with this new um, Apple Silicon because that's that's the same thing as a, as a JIT where you change the code while it's already running, and so that that use case is actually okay. Um, but I also want to say, if there's any Apple people listening, um, you like we we got everything to work, but we're we're jumping through hoops that just make the process slower for the developer, and like we have to copy. We, like in order to wipe the code signing cache, we have to pointlessly copy the file and then rename it back to the original name, which just is if you, if you're a developer and you're doing edit, compile, debug, repeat, it's like why am I just copying my entire application pointlessly in this whole process? Here's the one specific thing I'm asking for: uh, join the rest of the kernels in providing a copy file range syscall. It's a great syscall. Everyone's doing it. All the cool kids are doing it. Just give it to us, and it'll partially mitigate uh, the fact that we have to pointlessly copy files around. Uh, but yeah, sorry. Let me actually answer Laurie's question. So, uh, as far as uh, as far as the Zig project is concerned, uh, we're going to support Apple as long as it's popular with the users. Like we we exist to serve the users and. It's clear that the users like uh, Apple's stuff, so we're going to support it. Um, they did, you know, they introduced this stuff that that's, makes things difficult for for us because, uh, you know, this code signing. I don't understand what is the point of it. I would love to ask Frank why. Like, is there any crypto security justification for it? I don't understand what that might be. I'll try to ask you that in a second. Uh, but. Um, I mean, just big thanks to Jakub for for putting the the time in to to make things work. So, I mean, we'll we'll do it. We'll do it for you because we love you and because we exist to make uh, to make your development experience work for every platform that you want. Um, so, I'll talk about version numbers in a second. There's another topic though, which is what like what is the policy for what operating systems do we support? And this was something that um, Marler was bringing up on IRC yesterday. And he opened a, a proposal yesterday. He was talking about Windows. Because right now, the policy is um, we for, for closed source operating systems, Mac OS, Windows, we support only the same versions that the uh, respective companies uh, support in terms of security patches. The, the, main, per, the main point of limiting that is just to keep the scope small enough in, in the Zig project, because we do have limited resources. Like Jakub put heroic effort into, into making this stuff work during the last few weeks. But that's not something we can just expect or demand of him. That's like something that he was inspired to do and, and took it upon himself to do it. Um, so we do have to be careful. We don't want to make the scope too big, or we'll, we'll drown in, in, in trying to, to do everything. You know, we got to make sure we're making progress towards the, the milestones that are critical for for us to hit. We got to hit 1.0, or the whole project is going to be useless. So, for me, I want to make sure we don't we don't increase the scope too much. But that there is a question there, like how how you know, and and Marler brought up with Windows uh, that Windows 7 still has a huge market share. Maybe we should consider including that. Um, I don't have a great answer for that. I look forward to having a healthy discussion in that proposal that he opened. So as far as I'm concerned, this is an open topic that uh, you know our community is welcome to you know share perspectives and opinions about what uh, you know what should be in scope, what what versions of operating systems should be supported. So that's a topic. Uh, as far as version numbers go, 0.7.1 is coming up. That's my main priority. Um, I don't think that's going to support uh, Apple Silicon. That's going to be bug fixes only. That's what, you know, when you get a bug fix release, no one should be worried about um, scary changes. You should always be like, yes, I will always take the bug fix release. It's just bug fixes. Um, but based on Darkub's excellent work, uh, 0.8 is looking like it will support Apple Silicon. And um, if you want it before the release, uh, you're going to have to track master branch. But we have binary distributions of that. Should be OK. 
we'll code sign the, the binary distribution. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, new to do. <laughs> awesome. <Yeah. laughs> awesome. Thank you. So, Andrew, uh, just uh, to make sure I understand, understood clearly. So, you said that um, closed source operating systems, you don't want to support them past their normal lifetime, but there might be arguments in favor or popular versions that um, uh, they are still in use by a lot of people. Now, this brings me then to uh, actually then I think that the, the Windows OS that we should support more than anything else is Windows XP. It's both both open source and very popular still. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're making a joke that the source was leaked recently, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. if you can get the source, that's open source enough for me. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Legal disclaimer, Zig programmers do not look at the source code of Windows XP. <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, man. Wait, so I seriously do want to ask Frank, though, do you have any insight? Like, my mind is open. Like, what is the possible actual value that this code signing is providing? Do you know? Yeah, so actually having the kernel keep track of hashes of everything is not a new concept. I think NetBSD has been doing that forever. And the point is mainly to keep a list of trusted apps or trusted files in the case of NetBSD and untrusted files. So that whenever you get some malware or uh, any, uh, any way an attacker could have to change files on your operating system, it, uh, it mitigates the implications. So that's one uh, thing that may justify the presence of hashes. Another thing that they could be useful for is you know, software firewalls or software such as CrowdStrike, where network administrator can say, okay, this fleet of laptops is allowed to run this specific set of apps and not that specific set. So if we keep hashes of everything, maybe Apple can provide a nice clean API to do that. And another reason, and this is probably the main reason in the case of Apple, you know, code signing is not a new thing for Apple. They've been doing that forever. It's, well, not forever, but for quite a long time, especially on iOS. So this is uh, about real signatures, what I'm going to talk about, which is not a hash. This is a real signature. So you get some app and the developer with their developer account provide a signature and Apple signs this signature. Why do we have to do that? Well, first, a user can trust Apple for having signed something that they trust themselves. So you know that the binary is legit, but also, and this is something we saw recently with like Epic, for example, Apple has the power to say, all right, this developer account is now blocked. So they can revoke developer accounts. But one thing they can't do right now is revoke specific applications. They don't do that because the, all they can revoke is a specific signature, and a signature, as of today, is just a developer account signature. So they get some finer granularity as to what they can revoke. And the main point of that is, well, for, for good things, is to avoid malware and in general bad stuff. And it seems to work pretty well. I mean, I'm pretty sure that Every single day, you have a shitload of people submitting things to the App Store. So either malware or things pretending to be your bank, but it's not the real app from a bank. This is just to steal your credentials. And it seems like this kind of problem doesn't exist in the Apple world, but it probably does. And it's just a bunch of people trying to review stuff, plus some automation which is what we get with the new uh, notarization procedure and the, the ability for Apple to revoke developer accounts. But Wait, so, can so one question, apps. one follow-up question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, why wouldn't the malware try to use an ad hoc code signing? So ad hoc code signing uh, would still be quarantined first. So if you download it from the web browser, which is the main infection vector for malware, it's not going to work. So that's one thing. 
Yeah. Wait, so if we provide Zig uh, tarballs on the website, will they work? Or do we have to do something else? Uh, I think, Andrew, so, that uh, Frank was... The, the, the thing is, with current, with current code signing, which is not really signing, but just hashing, this is not possible. But I think what Frank is saying is that it, uh, since they are just, they want, even though we are putting our hands into the algorithm and messing around with it, they don't want people to see, uh, they don't want people to get their hands in because they want people to see uh, programmers, developers, to see code signing as an obscure, like a, an opaque box so that they can in the future swap out the implementation, make it a proper signature, which is not currently. And at that point, what Frank was describing uh, can come into effect. I'm not totally convinced about that, but even with ad hoc code signing, which is just a hash, it means that whenever Apple decides to block something in order for the malware to keep working, it has to be changed somehow. So it's an obstacle. So, yeah, that I makes just sense. Wanna, I just want to add that um, I can, I, I, okay, I don't, I didn't set up this mark to be able to SSH to my um, art looks, but um, I can I can generate the code signature there and run it here, no problem. But then again, I use um, SCP to copy the files over and there is no quarantine. So um, um, I'm not sure whether, um, does it only apply maybe to downloads from, from, from the web browser maybe or something, or maybe apps rather than binaries? Cause you know, this is, an, this is just a macro, so. So if you use something that's not quarantined, such as Curl or whatever, everything you download is not going to be quarantined. If you download something right. using your web browser, which is what most people do, then everything is going to be quarantined. Which is why when you use, use something like Curl, something by SH to install Rust or whatever, mm -hmm. this thing doesn't need to, to be signed. But if you download it from a browser, it's not going to work. Well, it will work. But a user has to say, okay, I trust this. Please open. Right. Yeah. Okay. Wow. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, okay, so uh, let's now open officially the floor for questions. So if anybody has a question for anybody on stream, uh, send a message, tweet chat, please, or uh, Discord. Uh, tag me please, especially if you if it's uh, not uh, Twitch chat. And maybe also mention, if you want uh, any specific person to answer the question, uh, mention also uh, their name. Uh, let's see, I'm scrolling up the chat to see if there was anything else that, uh, any question that was asked earlier uh, that we might want to bring up, but I can't find anything for now. Um, so, <laughs> okay, so the first question is from Felix. Uh, Frank, uh, how do you get these uh, athletic? How, how do you get Zwoll as a programmer? Sorry, how do I get what? Um, very muscular. Oh, uh, I try to work out. Well, I mean, I try when I can go to the gym, but with a lockdown, I haven't been able to do it for quite some time now. So actually what I'm using, uh, and this is a nice thing to have, if you somehow can go to the gym due to the lockdown or whatever, this is pretty cheap. This is just, you know, elastic bands. So with different resistance and you can do a lot of different things, you know, practice your legs, whatever with this. So that's pretty cheap. It's convenient, it's lightweight. Uh, but it's not the same thing as having real gear, of course, but it helps. So yeah, that's my trick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I think Felix didn't expect such a detailed answer. <laughs> oh, doing leg work while programming. Nice. <laughs> uh, you, you were ready for that question. You had those props just sitting right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't ready, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, um, so I can, I can, I think, uh, Frank, you probably made the best argument possible uh, in favor of uh, of uh, of how Apple, or a good reason why Apple uh, wants to lock down its systems, and uh, and one good effect that comes from that. I also have to say that. Um, 
like the even though so probably for the people watching and everybody probably watching this video i don't have to explain the problematic things when it comes to apple the apple store uh, locking down a system like you buy a system but then it's not even yours you're just uh, leasing it uh until then you give it to the landfill or you give it back for uh, to apple for 25 cents um <laughs> But the 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 positive side is really there, and uh, I personally can see this not just when it comes to malware, which maybe uh, I, I don't know. When you are a developer, when you're a programmer, software engineer, you like to think that you don't fall uh, victim of phishing and stuff, even though maybe occasionally you do. I have to say I had to wipe once or twice my Windows machine because I got one of those nasty things that lock you out of everything. You can even um, open the task manager anymore uh, but um, I think in the upper world you can see that even in other situations where uh, I, I, so I think that for people there are it, so my what I'm trying to say is that there are clearly a benefit for when uh, for a, uh, a system used by somebody that is not maybe super uh, tech literate so you give a computer to your grandma and you know that she's not going to get her money stolen by a fake bank app probably or at least that the chances of that happen happening on a mac are lower than happening on a windows pc uh, but i think that also for people uh, like us who are, don't, are not super affected by this um type of problem i think there is also positive for us when it comes to uh apps that do the worst that they can while not breaking the law in a sense like i think uh, i'm I'm very disappointed every time you have, like, for example, apps on Windows that you, you try to install it, in, install the application, and then it tries to drag in a bunch of crapware or other applications that try to do things that uh, that in the Apple Store where you have reviews, where you have a, a system that would probably not attempt. Um, so I think there is a benefit there too. That said, Apple is uh, Apple, uh, and... Uh, and um, uh, Epic learned that the hard way, I guess. They asked for it, so they, they wanted uh, to get their account disabled. So we'll see where that goes. Um, but yeah, interesting times, uh, and I think there is no one easy way of, of looking at the whole problem and just come out with a easy answer to everything. Um, I think that's fair yeah. fair enough to say, but I also want to present the other the other angle, which is Please my see. angle, which is that I think every CPU cycle spent on code signing and validating signatures in the kernel is just a wasted CPU cycle. It's no good. Hate it. <laughs> and I don't want to give power to Apple. I want more power for myself. I don't want the power to be in the in the proprietary kernel code where they just push a release and then now they decide what you can or can't run on your hardware. No good. That's also that's also reasonable. I, I mean, we probably should see at, uh, what's the what the jail, jailbreak uh, scene is going to bring us in that regard. Oh yeah, so, um, I actually actually have a prediction on that. I predict that very soon there's going to be a shell that is a loader. So in the shell, everything you run, the the shell is the being like the kernel. It's parsing the elf file. It's load because it's it's position independent executables. So it just ignores the code signature and it just loads all the sections and somewhere in memory and then jumps to it. That's my prediction. Jacob, you wanted to say something? Oh uh, no, I was just gonna um, um, jump on the bandwagon here and say that yeah, for um, for typical users, um, it's fine. You've got Rosetta, so you don't have to actually. Everything works. But if I want to use ARM and I want to actually M1 is pretty impressive. Like I have to admit, like I've actually I recompiled LVM yesterday three times. Um, uh, yeah, Frank says that this is my fetch. Maybe it is. I don't know. Um, uh, it was my mistake um, once, and then I did, just did it twice again. Uh, it actually took only twenty minutes, uh, and this is on the MacBook Air. You know, no funds, nothing like this, and it's very impressive what you can do with a uh, system like that. If you design it yourself, that's cool. Um, but yeah, but at, this, at the same time, I you know Apple has got everything vertically integrated now. They own the entire stack, I think, right? Do they? I think so. Maybe except the screens, not yet. But you know they got everything. Like so, basically, yeah, it's like leasing that, that thing, even yours. So 
Yeah. So well, I don't like that. I, I would like to take full, um, you know, full um, advantage yeah. of the hardware that I get, but I can't. So. Yeah, well, uh, you mentioned the screens. I don't know if they produce them, probably not, but they also have their hands in there. Like um, if you watch any video about repairing Macs, um, you will see that like new uh, Apple hardware, and I think this is not, uh, so I'm not 100% sure if this is uh, this applies to the laptops too, but I think it applies to the um, to the new iPhones uh, at the very least, which means that probably it's going to get everywhere, where even where it's not right now. Uh, what they do with screens is that they uh, have serial numbers, uh, har- like they write the serial number somewhere in, in the memory of the phone, and if you boot it up, with a different screen, even if it's a perfectly legit original screen by Apple, but if the serial number doesn't match, the phone refuses to boot. And uh, even with the camera module, I think there was a video where you could see the the, the phone, like m- not only the, the, what the phone did was like show error messages, which kind of seemed like the phone was kind of malfunctioning, uh, but the phone wasn't malfunctioning. The phone was just refusing to use a camera module that uh, was not the one originally installed. And uh, so if you want to have any kind of repair with your phone, the only thing that you can do is go to uh, an Apple Genius whatever par and have them tell you that you had water damage on them, even though you didn't. And I don't know, but th- th- there's there's stories about all this stuff. So actually, I have to d- defend that. Like, they're actually pretty nice. Like customer, ser- customer services of Apple are pretty good. I, I always had good experience with this. But the fact that you have to go there and basically they have to tell you like, no, sorry, you have to replace the battery. And then basically you have to shell out for the new iPhone. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I could do it from home then. You know, what's the point? Um, but, you know, I guess it were, you know, whatever floats your boat, right? Whatever you prefer. If you want, like, not worry about stuff. You just pay Apple and that's it. That's you done. And I'm, I'm pretty sure many people actually do that. Um, yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Anyway, um, I- what? Sorry. Well, oh, am I just the like token non Apple user in this? I just realized that that's what I that's my role here, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I'm I'm middle ground. So. Yeah. Uh, Frank, what's your take on on Apple systems? Love them? Hate them? I hate them. No, actually, I love them as a user. I hate them as a developer uh, because the documentation sucks. But as a user. It just works. I'm sorry, what, what about... docs? Documentation what sucks. Docu- what documentation? Well, of APIs <laughs> in general. It's the joke. And if you're looking for specific examples, you, you're better off go, going to Stack Overflow rather than uh, their own documentation. But other than that, the hardware is great. Uh, the quality of service is great. I mean, yeah, and as you said before, if you want to uh, recommend something to someone who's not tech savvy, it's a good choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have to say, so Andrew, I think that uh, probably you won't find, I think, many people that are software engineers that are in tech that really love Apple, but you find people that are willing to just... work with the with the flows like let, let me tell you for me personally um i when i was in university and before that i used to hate apple i used to really genuinely hate apple i remember i had in my class this guy which we, we called the guy uh, we nicknamed him apple man and this guy had every single apple device he would like wake up the the during the, in the middle of the night for a new Apple release and go there. And I remember, and I remember like he was, I don't know, like the anti Christ uh, Christ for me in a sense. And <laughs> but after that, and here's here's the I think the interesting thing. Um, after a while, I actually realized that uh, my hatred for Apple was. I was losing the game. I was losing the same game that I was thinking I was winning. And what I mean by that, I mean that uh, Apple is clearly, well, obviously Apple is good at branding and, and they build their brand. And I mean, they're probably the best on the planet doing that. And I hated all the followers, the, like all, all the mindless zombies that they created. And what I failed to realize for a while is that uh, even though it was by... Uh, 
it was the inverse process. It was by negation. I was kind of the same in hating them. I was being a, like, my behavior was affected by their brand. So at one point I decided to let go and I had this uh, Dell XPS 16. Uh, this laptop was nice, but uh, if you used it for too long, th for some reason, the part underneath the, the trackpad would heat up and it would start burning your fingers after a while. Like I remember feeling my fingers burning while using it. It had like plastic thingies at the sides that would, uh, that also because of the heat, they would, uh, like the glue would give up and like the plastic things would fall apart. I had Ubuntu on there and this was the phase where Ubuntu was, uh, I think switching from GNOME to, uh, whatever the hell they had after what's it called. Anybody? Unity. Unity. Thank you. Unity, which I hated. And then I also had a kernel module for Wi-Fi where the Wi-Fi had two switches, a hardware switch and a software switch. And for some reason, uh, the two switches would get out of sync. So whenever you enable Wi-Fi from the, by touching the button on the laptop, which would turn on the, the hardware switch, you would toggle off the software switch and vice versa. Only solution, reloading the current module every time. So at one point, th this was my life. And I, and I said, and, and that was when the, that was 2012, uh, when the new, uh, MacBook Pro Retina, the first generation came out and I said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to switch to that. And, <laughs> uh, and it was a happy, dumb, uh, programmer with a Linux surrogate for a long time. The only moment where I started, like where you made me see hit a limit on the Apple system was when we were trying to debug a executable and then like you try to get GDB running on Mac that doesn't really work. It, uh, hangs, it will never sure. work now. I'm just saying. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. And, and like, and the debugger didn't, wasn't working well, and, but, but before that I never actually hit that limit. So I don't know. I think that's where we are. I think everybody that is, is, uh, using Apple just wants, uh, the nice stuff. Maybe they want office and they don't suffer the bad part too much. Uh, but Apple is changing oh, that uh, equation. So we'll see. I'm going to quickly jump to Andrew's side here. So um, for me, that point was three weeks ago. Um, uh, you know, with Apple Silicon and stuff, actually, honestly, I took a beating because it, this is horrible. That's why I was joking to Frank, like, what well, documentation? There's none. I'm sorry, but nothing is documented. I was reading the code, learning, like, what the hell has gone on. But anyway, uh, you, you mentioned the heating problem. So yesterday, um, because I've got this fetish with LVM stuff, I left the laptop on. You, you know those... Um, do you guys have them like those um hot water bottles you know that you use for like you, you put the hot water in and then you use to warm up and stuff you know the, the classic stuff right i put my macbook air on the chair uh, and i came back i, I pick it, picked it up actually it was it was it was compiling lvm it was really comfy and warm so they also do tend to warm up a lot um so with apple i tend to find that the hot spots are not near the trackpad they're closer to um top of the keyboard uh, and they had the same problem as well so i think the heat dissipation thing is just it's everywhere there's like oh no yeah running around. that i agree so. but having the trackpad heat up i assure you it's like uh if i got if i'm going to hell i'll get that i'll get a laptop in hell you should use them then you know <laughs> what do you use trackpad for i don't know i mean yeah i knew that somebody would bring this up yeah this shows another another weakness i guess <laughs> but so uh, sorry my my attitude on the on the whole thing it's not it's not that i have a side right because I mean, hey, look, I'm going to move my webcam for a second here. This is my Linux desk. I got Windows over here. I got um, a table set up here with a MacBook Air, an old one, and a spare computer to put any operating system on it. And then that empty table right there, that's for the new M1 that's coming in the mail next week. Like, my attitude is I have to support everything. I have to test everything. And I'm just annoyed at how much more work I spend on on Apple stuff than everything else. That's my that's my take on it. It's not like it's not sides. It's just like, man, how much hoops do I have to jump through for this one thing? Yeah, and, and one more hoop to jump through <laughs> and then, uh, at the next uh, Apple keynote. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Although I will say, when, I actually am looking is forward it? to supporting. Uh, 64-bit ARM Windows. We actually have a head start on that, thanks to the uh, MinGW project. Nice. Cool. 
I already saw an article of someone uh, managing to install Windows on their uh, MacBook M1. Yeah, I actually, I think Frank tweeted this stuff. I think it was yesterday or something, and I had a look as well. Yeah, um, and it's, it, it worked. So there you go. <laughs> I see. I think, Andrew, you know what? I think we should like uh, collect some money and give you like a, a, I don't know, $500 a gift card for the App Store so that you can start buying. Like you get used to the idea of buying small apps that look cute, are nice, like they has nice color buttons with a nice shade and everything else. And I think uh, I think your, your heart will soften for Apple. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I feel like I'm being preached at over here. Well, but actually, jokes aside, like this is what they do. When I bought the uh, the Retina MacBook, they they included I don't know, I think 200, 250 euros worth of uh, uh, Apple Store credit, which basically means that they charge me that money uh, with the initial purchase, and, and that's how they try to hook you. But um, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Apple is annoying. And uh, again, I, maybe I personally never hit much, many of the of these issues because I've never done systems programming in it. I was running Python, JavaScript, Java, this kind of stuff mainly. Uh, but yeah, once uh, control over the system becomes more important, uh, then then you start seeing that, that that what before was a good Linux surrogate for you, now it's not a good surrogate anymore. Um, I, I think with the Redis project, uh, I think I remember one day uh, Anti Reds also tweeting about something about this. Uh, I think it was about compiling Redis. The compiling Redis on Mac for some reason would like cut off his audio because something would like hoard some kind of resource and 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 then audio couldn't keep up. I don't know something like this, but yeah. Um, so let's see if there's any I other can, questions. I, yeah. I've got. I've got one more anecdote, and I'm I'm, I'm trying to remember this. So, because um, uh, mm -hmm. he mentioned that for me on the DTK things were working, and that was because it turns out that the um, OS version that I had was busted for some reason. I couldn't update. I couldn't do anything. Like I couldn't install the new Xcode. If I installed it, it wouldn't work and stuff, right? Um, so you know, um, I leased, and this is a proper lease, right? I leased, um, and this is another thing that Apple. I think Apple is the only company on the planet that can make you do this. So I had to shell out like five hundred dollars to get a Mac Mini that I have to give back. Like, and uh, you know, obviously I don't get the money back, so that's, that's awesome. So I have the privilege to to work on the Mac Mini for a year and then just to give it back. I was like, awesome, that's perfect. That is insane. I mean, I, first of all, like, thank you for doing that because you did awesome work and you like, you paid for that with your own money and you just took that on and then we all get to have the benefits of it. So that's awesome. And then also it's just like, how do they get people, like they're getting people to pay to, overcome the obstacles that they created and then you don't even get to keep the hardware <laughs> right, that's insane right. oh, oh by the way it's actually not 500 it's, it's yeah it's, so it's actually 600 because as frank mentioned you have to be a developer to be a developer you have to subscribe to subscribe you have to pay 99 dollars or 100 now a year a year right anyway this aside so i um, i had this i had many like chats with frank about this because you know the, the stuff was just working for him and he could update and stuff and i couldn't and this is the best bit so imagine that you are a Linux developer or a, you develop an app or something, you don't have a Mac at home, you get the DTK. To restore a DTK, you need another Mac. That's it. You need them basically like, um, what's it called in um, electronic engineering? Um, oh crap, I forgot. Actually, this is my degree and I forgot. Hey, a uh, programmer. Oh, daisy chaining, right? Oh. No, no, you daisy chain, right? You daisy chain stuff. So basically if you have like a, you got a battery and you, you just want to plug some stuff in, then you're just going to divide the voltage and just daisy chain everything together. And this is exactly what you do here. You take two Macs, you plug them in with USB-C, and then you pray to God that you're not going to break it. I was like, really? So hope, you know, thankfully, I had a Mac at home, but then I had to, so my personal Mac, I had to upgrade to a beta program to get the soft that is not supported yet so that I could restore the DK. You know, and then pray to God that actually everything is going to work. Hopefully it did, but, you know. Yeah. But I mean, the DTK was just a prototype. So it's okay. Yeah, $500 prototype. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Apple experience uh, brought his say in chat, <laughs> pretty much. Well, it can be everything. Uh... I don't know. I think open source has to step up. 
uh, the only like the the only thing that comes for me is that uh, uh, honestly, for me personally, the the equation in favor of Apple is starting to change a little bit. Like this cost signing thing is really annoying, and uh, the more things pile up, the more uh, developers will think of moving somewhere else. And uh, at the end of the day, it's that's pretty much it. Nothing more. We'll see how it goes. So, oh, I, yeah. I want to see more ARM out there. Honestly, it's 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 a it's it's actually a. It's really good experience, even coding for. I know it's more difficult because of the the five line instruction or fixed line, but um, and you know you have to 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 twist your arm once or twice, but it's really good. Um, it's 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 really cool architecture. Nice pun. <laughs> oh, by the way, so Jacob mentioned it was that... not intended, but <laughs> Jacob mentioned that um, compiling an LVM on a MacBook Air, Apple Silicon takes 20 minutes. Uh, Andrew, how long does it take you to compile on Linux? Uh, to compile LLVM? I have a pretty beefy yeah. laptop. I think I can hit or beat that at Mark. OK. It's not, uh, it, I should probably um, um, be more precise here. It's not the entire LLVM. It's only the, the stuff that we need for Zixon. That's Clang, uh, Clang Extra Tools plus LD, because we don't need all the other uh, uh, crap, right? Oh, and this is this is this is. Um, so I gave you a present, Andrew. Now I'm gonna take it back. Sorry, apologies. Um, uh, I um, there is LVM eleven oh one release client one that's out there, and I um actually used it. And guess what? It's not been patched yet. So um, any of you Mac users, um, you know, install from Homebrew because you're gonna still have to apply the same patches that Frank and I found for you because LVM config is not fixed. Yay. Um. Uh, but we will be able to uh, apply those patches to the Bootstrap repository, right. yes. uh, and so, and we can, and that's the one we're using to produce the tarballs. So if you use that, it will work, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. If we do this, then it should be fine. Also, I wanted to point yeah, so, out uh, um, yeah. with the new uh, headers that we have, um, we actually can use that project, the Zig Bootstrap repository project, to cross compile Zig. It's uh, to Bootstrap Zig. Uh, targeting Mac OS on any platform. That now works. Um, or I tested it on, on hosting it on Linux. Once we have that one extra thing to your post fix up thing that does the, the L system. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. that's so a cool that, milestone. Yeah. 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 So that's, yeah, that's true. Um, so if we fix this, then, then we're done. Oh, we're good. Um, I was, I was going to say that um, you, you've got a big laptop. I also have the, um, uh, I've got a like MacBook Pro, the 16 inch, I think last year version or something, I can't remember. It's got i9, like 10 generations. So it's got like 16 uh, logical cores, right? It's pretty fast and it's actually slower than M1. It's so sad. I mean, I mean, obviously I didn't run the benches yet, proper benches, but it feels slower, especially if you compare core to core, it, it's insane. So um, at, the, at least that that's a, that's a really positive thing about M1. Nice. And that's I cool. I think. Yeah. Right. Sorry, go Andrew. Ahead. No, no, you go. Oh, I was just going to respond. Yeah. So on my laptop, I have the uh, Intel i9 9980. Eight, eight core with hyper threading. So I think that's the same thing you're talking about. Uh, yeah, probably similar. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether Apple, uh, you might have like a better um, a cat in the sense that you might have the better wattage on the CPU. I think Apple was picking like really low wattage Intel CPUs, and that might be the, the thing. Yeah, uh, I think I saw a tweet by Frank, uh, who uh, tweets uh, everything that's uh, that's new. Uh, I think Frank, uh, you tweeted a, a leak that a new CPU M1X, I believe, uh, for the new Mac has leaked. So, uh, are you gonna buy the new MacBook Pro 16 inch? I absolutely will. I mean. It looks super fast already, uh, the good old M1. So the next one's going to be even faster. But you know, you were discussing about speed. So I got an A9 something uh, as well. It takes about a hour to compile LLVM on my laptop. But the main reason is that after like 10 minutes, it starts to get hot and the CPU starts to throttle. So it's super fast at the beginning. And as the temperature gets higher, it gets slower and slower. And I think that this is something that doesn't happen on ARM CPUs. This is the main difference. 
Yeah. Right. I believe the the um uh what's it called production? Oh my god. Uh like the the nanometer like the the size of uh of the silicon chip that that uh Intel is using for the CPUs are like the why am I missing this expression right now? I, sorry. But I think like they have a transistor every five or six centimeters or, so, or five or six meters even. Where, <laughs> like uh, jokes aside, like they, their 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 process is is kind of lagging behind, I believe, uh, compared to uh, uh, I don't know what it is for Apple Silicon, but I think uh, AMD is five nanometers, right? So it's M1. So I, I think AMD five, is seven. Uh, yeah, okay. I think Apple, uh, Apple Silicon is five. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's five. Yeah, yeah while well, Intel is anyway, fifteen yeah. centimeters. Frank was, saying, Frank was saying about the the throttling and stuff. This the power supply of the MacBook Air, and it's I I could you not? It's thirty watts. I, I'm not gonna bring the one for the for the MacBook Pro because it's definitely larger. But um, I, I you know I got it. I was like, is that for an iPad? Um, so yeah, that was a big surprise. Right. So the, the the power draw is is very low, is what you're saying, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I see. Uh, makes sense. Yeah, uh, Nipsey is saying centimeters. Yeah, that, it's an hyperbole. <laughs> uh, hey, does anyone does anyone know what is the amount of watts they give you on a typical airplane? Because I have had laptops before that I was able to charge, and also ones that I wasn't able to charge. I bet someone in the chat will know. I'm not sure. Maybe 60? 60 watts per hour? Uh, so I'm not 100% sure. I think 60 might be a decent guess. And I think 60 might be in the border, at the border between some things uh, being able to charge and some things not being able. But I'm not 100% sure, though. Yeah, not watts per hour. Watts, that's it. Uh, anyway, um, so any other uh, anecdote or anything else that you guys want to say before we call it a day? People thinking. Let's give it. Let's give them a second. Well, we were talking about Apple controlling the operating system. Yeah. What they do control is not that just the operating system. It's actually the whole ecosystem. Look at this. All right, I just bought this. This is the, the new HomePod, HomePod Mini. Yeah. Pretty cheap. However, if you want this thing to be useful, you need Apple Music. And if you want to control it, you need an Apple device, like this one. And if you want uh, to... Uh, and to uh, you know, Apple Glasses and stuff. And yeah, then yeah. go to a different place and keep listening to what you were doing, you need an iPhone. And since you have pretty much everything, you need uh, an Apple uh, laptop. And because everything works really well together, you need this as well. And this right. is how you got hooked, actually. You just buy one Apple item, and then you're like, OK, this is going to work really well with my iPhone. And my iPhone is going to work really well with this, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So they control the whole thing. I mean, I can use Spotify or whatever with this, but this is not going to be the same experience than if I use just Apple products. Yeah. And they're pretty good at it, right? Um, they are really the good. Ecosystem. And... I, I, think they're, I think they're the best in yeah. actually giving you this experience. That's true. Yeah. Holy shit. Uh, but then again, I think Frank, I think it was Frank who posted a tweet. Um, maybe it wasn't you. I can't remember. Somebody actually managed to finally um, uh, get like SSH access to a HomePod. So somebody, somebody, I think, managed to jailbreak it, which you know means they can actually do more stuff. You can actually see what's inside rather than you know whatever they give you. So um, yeah. By the way, uh, Frank, that, that's a really good point uh, for uh, good or or worse. That is, um, I. But I mean, it, it's nice. Like uh, there was Isaac Isaac Yonemoto the other day tweeting that he was asking uh, about what's a good way of copy pasting something from your mobile device to your computer. And if you if you don't have anything Apple, I guess the, the shortest path is using an instant messaging app. You send the message to yourself and then you access the same messaging application from your desktop if you don't have whatsapp if you have whatsapp you can kind of do that too but it's even worse uh, on apple devices the copy from one paste in the other you're done it, uh, it just works 
I'm, I'm going to pull Frank here, and I hope that he's going to give his story about airdrop because that that was actually very informative as well, right? That you of air, airdrop. So feel free to 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 jump so, in. So yeah, Frank. just one anecdote about the uh, airdrop. Uh, you know, I'm a fashion photographer, and when I do fashion shows, right after a presentation, a lot of models come to see me because they want to get the pictures. And I just use AirDrop for that. It's absolutely amazing. Everybody with an iPhone can get the pictures right away. And that only works with Apple. Yeah. Are we, are so we going to get paid? I think pay for printing. And... <laughs> Apple, if you're watching, yes, we roasted you a little bit in the, in the beginning. Yes, we have one guy here who is kind of supposed to be the counter voice so that we look uh, well balanced, but wink, wink. Uh, Throw Apple hardware at us. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I don't know. I think we are not. I think we are too honest and, and natural to actually be good Apple. Uh, I don't know faces. Um, but but yeah. But the, the integration is real, and uh, and even for all these things, it's not like Apple invented them. I remember that you could copy files over Bluetooth even before Apple came out with AirDrop. Or actually, I don't know the precise timeline, but it's not something unique. The problem is that Bluetooth has always been crappy in so many ways. Uh, headphones. Uh, I I don't know. Maybe today it's different, but before I switched uh, to the Apple ecosystem because I too have the freaking. Um, Air, uh, earbuds and stuff but i remember pairing my headphones over bluetooth with two different devices annoying sharing files over bluetooth janky um i don't know it, not everything was worse but things haven't improved much and apple has just been able to improve uh i like how i i get a call and my phone rings and i can sorry and my computer rings so i can take the, f the phone call from uh, sorry, I get the call and I can take the phone call from my laptop and it just works. Th that said, uh, actually, I, I want to give a counterpoint here when yeah. I'm at home and suddenly like five devices start ringing at the same time. It's pretty annoying. <laughs> so I'm just, you know, this is, um, this is one of the negative things. <laughs> You need more devices. At one point, then you just, you start hearing this global ring. You don't care anymore. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I need less. Okay. You need an Apple cheap. So. Fewer, sorry, fewer, no less. <laughs> um, no, yeah, that's that's true. I think you can configure this, but uh, like the the um, the fact that you can interoperate, like the ecosystem is good. It's a trap. It's a honey trap, but uh, it is what it is. And uh, that said, I remember that uh, the the only uh, software gave me. Uh, and an experience that for me was comparable with what I'm getting with Apple was Nokia at, at the time where it had Symbian and you had like a Nokia PC suite uh, installed on your computer and you could do a lot of good stuff with that old times, I guess, by today's standard. But anyway, this is where we are. Andrew, you don't look happy about where the discussion is going. Uh, I'm just anti-ad advertisement. <laughs> Well, well, you know what? I think these are these are uh, the real takeaway is that um, the open source and I think this really I think it, it's a good way for uh, even ending the show. Um, what app, the the one good thing that Apple is doing is that they care about the end user experience, and in open source, we don't always have that uh, as the center point of what we are doing. And I think that is a problem that we need collectively to address. And I think that Zig, as you said earlier, by making one of the Zig Zen points, and as you already said multiple times, by being centered on the final user, I think that's the way, that's the point that you need to hit so that you can then help people break away from the Apple and in general, like closed source, closed environments, and walled, garden, uh, walled gardens, and all these kind of monsters. Well, I definitely agree that we want to focus on the end user experience. I don't agree that that's what Apple is doing. I think that Apple is using the end user experience as a means to an end, and that end is obviously profit. And they're they're winning. They're winning capitalism. So good for them. Um, but I mean, think about this M1 stuff, right? Like what they did, they, I mean, 
earlier in the stream, people were acting confused, like, oh, why does the code signing only happen on ARM and not the other one? Like, I can, I can answer that for you. Uh, here's what's happening. They want to do all this stuff that's going to help them make more money, but it's a worse user experience. Like, Jakub bought this laptop, and it doesn't even work. He has to run, find, and then code sign every binary before he can even use his computer. That's not focusing on the end user experience. But what they want to do is they want to do this thing where they're going to change how things work so they have more control in the ecosystem. But they know it's going to be bad for the user experience. They know it's going to be unpopular. So they're doing it at a strategic moment, right when this new har hardware is coming out. And that's all people can talk about, you know, the performance, the low heat, all that stuff. So they're, it's like a sleight of hand, like a magician's trick, where they're making you look at this cool thing over here. And then over behind your back, they're just like taking away that thing that now you're not looking at. So. Do they create a good user experience? Yeah, you know they do a pretty good job. Things generally work, and that's how you know that's how they can get you to, to participate in the ecosystem. But like, don't be fooled that that's their goal, right? Their goal is to get your to open your wallet and dump it all out, right? <laughs> yeah, I agree. But we need to be able to match that. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can you can't even blame people for choosing, I guess, the least of all evils. Again, it depends on your use case. Uh, but uh, uh, I agree 100% with your point about the, the magician trick. The problem, though, is that they, they can afford to do that because they got they they provide they have they provided so much value on one end that they can then play these tricks. Um, if it was uh, somebody else, probably it wouldn't work. But in any case, this just show goes to show that uh, we can do better. And at the very least, if we don't try to play weird tricks, uh, it means that we have we can reach a higher ceiling even uh, from the software point of view. So uh, something I guess to think about. Uh, the people watching. Yeah, I mean, I, it, to turn it to more a positive note, as far as Zig is concerned, uh, our that our the end user experience is our actual goal. That's that's the difference between Zig Software Foundation and Apple is that the end user experience is the goal. There is no money goal. The money is the money is a means to accomplish that goal rather than vice versa. So that that's the positive that note that we can that we can end it on. So if Apple is listening, give us the copyright draw, and we're going to be fine for now. Yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a start. And then we can talk about yeah. more stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, any, any final words? Uh, let's do maybe a round uh, for any closing thoughts. Frank, do you want to start? Yeah, I'm just super excited about ARM CPUs in general. And I saw that the M1 has some interesting instructions to speed up crypto. So that's super exciting to me. And I hope to be able to use this instruction for Zig to speed up SHA-2, SHA-3, and more. So that's pretty cool. And one of the reasons I'm excited about these new CPUs. Yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, Andrew? Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I just despite my my words a minute ago, I got one of these laptops coming thanks to a, a generous donor, and uh, I'm I'm very interested in in making the Zig user experience to be on on par with uh, how it is everywhere else. Awesome, Jacob. Uh, we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> the poor guy that is doing the actual work. Yeah, <laughs> we're getting there. Uh, uh, yeah, believe it or not, I did enjoy it, except for the fact um, that there's no dogs. But you know, now I guess I know where to look. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to point out, because um, Frank said that there is some tweaks to the, um, the, the ARM instruction set. There's more, because the calling convention is different as well. <laughs> Jakub, you okay. are the documentation right now. Oh, I, hope oh, awesome. I hope you realize that. Cool. I promise, LVM guys, I'm gonna come over to you and I'm gonna pour the stuff over. I just don't like C++, but you know. It give them a zip file. And, yeah, that's and they well, link that, to but it. That's, I'm sorry, but that's exactly what I was doing at the, the Go guys and everybody ignored me. So I was like, oh, okay. Hmm. <laughs> um, okay. So I think we can end the show here then. Uh, don't, don't go away, uh, fine guests. Uh, uh, stay here while I do the outro, and then maybe we can uh, exchange a few words uh, after the 
uh, after I played the outro. So, um, thank you everyone for participating. This was awesome. I think this, I hope this was also interesting for the viewers and I'm sure YouTube is gonna uh, also love the, the, this discussion. I think it's interesting to see how a project, a open source project, um, tackles these issues with, which are uh, really real and contemporary. And as you can see, uh, not everybody uh, feels the same way about Apple, but we all share uh, a common final goal, which is to you know, get a good user experience for Zig users, no matter what the platform is. People have different uh, life situations and they make different choices for their own reasons. And um, yeah, I hope this was uh, inter interesting for all the people watching. <laughs> Alex says four Windows users, and I think we have more than four. Like we, we have, you were using Windows. I don't know if you switch now, but there's Windows, there's you, uh, King is using Windows. At, uh, uh, there's a list of few people that we know of. Uh, I use all three, like Andrew. I, I don't use BSDs because um, I have a hard time actually getting them to work, but um, I use Linux, Windows, and Mac. So yeah, and uh, so that was fun. Next show time is gonna be next week. I put in the final screen a tentative date of the fifth, but I haven't agreed on it yet with Matt Knight because Matt Knight is gonna uh, talk about his package manager. And uh, the second uh, part of that Showtime episode is going to be a event like we did for the uh, 0.7 release where I don't have a name for it yet. I was thinking something around the lines of a show us event, but the idea is like you come in voice chat in Discord and you bring us something for us to discuss. So maybe you're working on a project, showcase your project. Uh, you can enable uh, desktop sharing and show us uh, what you're working on. Uh, you just want to ask a question, come ask a question. You want just to make a comment, come and make a comment. So uh, it's going to be something like this because also Next Showtime episode is going to be the last episode of 2020. We're going to take a break. Uh, there's going to be the holidays coming up. As I said, I depleted almost my uh, speaker pool, so no speakers, no showtime. And uh, then we can all take a break and come back, uh, re-energize in 2021. Hopefully, uh, change in the year will make things better. I don't think so, actually. Uh, actually, let me tell you, uh, let me tell everybody one, uh, uh, one thing. I remember this from school. These are all the things that you learn in school, that you're supposed to learn in school, but then forget about and end up being an ignorant uh, adult. But there was this story about a calendar man trying to sell calendars to people. And at one point, the calendar man finds a, uh, somebody on the street and asks them if they want to buy a calendar. And to entice them into buying the calendar, th this guy says, uh, the, 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 the seller says, oh, you should buy a calendar for next year. Next year is going to be amazing for sure and you will want a calendar and then the the person says well but how was this year and the seller says well not that great and how was the previous year uh not that great either and how was the year before that uh that was also awful too and at the end uh the guy for out of compassion just buys the calendar i remember this story anyway i'm sure 2021 is gonna be so much better than, than uh, everything now. So, <laughs> uh, I guess, uh, see you all then. Bye.